least very briefly introduce um, uh, Elena Niedu, who um, is going to be uh, showing us a project that she's been working on with a group of people um, in Corte Gracio, which is um, using machine transcription on the, the Vatican Apostolic Archive. Um, really exciting work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, good evening. I am Elena Nieto. I am a PhD student on my last year in uh, Roma 3 University, which is the third university of Rome. Um, and I will, and I'm here talking about uh, the, this project we're having that is called Incodice Ratio. I'd start from the name itself. Uh, the, uh, the explanation is it's, it's pretty self-explanatory in the, in the following line, but however, it's a pun. Uh, between uh, two, the meaning, on the meaning of the word codice in Italian. Because codice in Italian both means code, as in software code, as well as uh, codex, such as, for example, legal codices or manuscripts in general. Uh, so we're, I'm going to talk about how we perform the automatic machine transcription on medieval manuscripts. So uh, where does this project start from? Um, it starts from a group of, uh, from two groups different, of very different people. On the uh, gray side, you have uh, uh, the computer scientists, uh, in particular, Professor Paolo Merialdo, who is leading the project, uh, and uh, Professor Donatella Firmani and Simone Scardapane, uh, who are both assistant professors. Donatella is at Roma 3, and Donatella and Merialdo are uh, at Roma 3. Uh, Simone is uh, at Sapienza, and then there's me, who, uh, uh, with my PhD, with my master's degree first and uh, my PhD. And then on the white side, you have archivists and paleographers. Uh, so uh, there is uh, Serena, uh, who works at Roma 3 as well. She's a professor in paleography. And uh, Marco Maiorino, who is a professor of paleography at uh, uh, the, um, in the Vatican, in the, at the Vatican University. And Francesca is a researcher as well. So you might ask yourselves, uh, um, what do data scientists and archives and archivists and humanists in general have in common? Well, uh, I've thought this about this, and uh, I think we have more in common than I think. And uh, basically, well, we're all about that big data. <laughs> we we share this passion for extracting knowledge. In particular, Professor Merialdo has been active in the precisely in the field of. Uh, 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 discovering knowledge uh, from uh, web sources uh, and uh, from what now we call uh, big data. So the, all the whole mass of information that is produced every day uh, on, on the web. So, but today we will talk about what I like to call historical big data in uh, the Vatican Apostolic Archive. So uh, you see here uh, Mount Everest. To give you a scale on how large is the data that the Vatican Apostolic Archives uh, stores and preserves. This is Mount Everest, which is about 8.8 uh, .8 kilometers tall. And if we took every shelving of the Vatican Apostolic Archive and uh, put it sideways, like one on top of the other, we would get this. Okay, this is what we would get. It's almost at scale. It's almost 10 times Mount Everest. It's 85 kilometers. I don't know how many miles is that. I am very sorry <laughs> for the people in in the audience who are not f familiar with kilometers. Uh, and so it's, it's quite the distance, okay? So it's almost 10 times Mount Everest. And it's not just the amount, it's not just the volume, but also the variety of it that is stunning. Uh, there I chose, actually, Marco Maiorino chose, for ex who is the curator and archivist at the, the Vatican Secret Archive, uh, chose four examples uh, of uh, documents uh, from four different countries and four different continents uh, and different times uh, that are particularly valuable, but there is many, many much more. So uh, the, ones, the one you see on top uh, with the uh, Chinese sigil is a letter from uh, uh, the, Empress, the last Empress of China who took the, my same name, actually, Elena, and she converted to Christianism and uh, she was writing to the Pope. These are all letters to the Popes in various times. So this is from China. Uh, uh, on the bottom, on the, on the same side of the, of the, of the mountain, uh, you can see a letter with some sigils down there, and that is the letter that was written uh, uh, in favor of the divorce of Henry VIII, 
for example. That's a document that has relatively recently discovered in the archive. And it's very important because you can see all the signatures of the noblemen and the clergy that uh, endorsed this proposition, for example. Uh, and then on the other side, on the top, uh, you can find a document that is written in Arabic, and it comes from Africa, um, precisely from um, Morocco. And it's, a, it's actually a letter always to the Pope from uh, the um, caliphate. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm lacking the words because... Um, and basically it's a testimony of interreligion, interreligion, interreligion uh, uh, rapport. So uh, that basically what this caliph is saying is that, uh, what this letter is saying is that they are very happy with the bishop they're having in Morocco. And so please to extend this, his stay. Uh, and the very last one comes from uh, North America. And you might see that uh, it's, uh, it's on a quite particular, uh, um, it's on a quite particular texture, and that's because it was carved on wood. And it's a letter from the, uh, from the chief of the Ojibwe tribe. And that is the only testimony we have of the Ojibwe language written. It's, uh, it has been uh, transliterated into Latin character and carved into wood and sent. Uh, all the way to Rome. So this is the variety, not just the volume of it. So just imagine, this is one of the, of the holes that hold all of, all of these documents, and it goes from back to 1,000 years at least, but it is all, also older. Well, imagine all this information we have, and imagine if we were able to access, this, uh, to access it the way we right now access, uh, uh, for example, the web. So hyperlinks, full text search, and uh, building knowledge bases uh, uh, to which we can ask uh, complex questions and uh, how much it would uh, empower historians uh, and scholars in the humanities in general and the research. So how, how do we go about it? Of course, AI, <laughs> but um, so far the techniques we have, uh, they work of, of knowledge extraction, they work very well on text text that has been, that is in the format of uh, strings, basically. So like the text you would find in HTML documents. What we actually have and what we actually have when uh, many, many archives say they have digitized their content uh, is actually pictures of text. And as you may know, uh, uh, the text content in dot is not immediately available if you have an image. You have first to transcribe, for example, to perform OCR. Now, if we're talking about uh, printed text, that is pretty easy. It's pretty much considered a solved problem. You just, there is many uh, tools you can just uh, train, pretty simple. You can just train and use to your specific domain and they have high accuracy. But there is, as, as I mentioned, there is many documents that were written way before print was invented, such as this. And these are the Vatican registers. Uh, they are uh, letters as well. Uh, and they are all the official letters that the Pope sent uh, uh, to worldwide, basically. And they cover lots of important historical facts, for example, uh, the birth of the Franciscan order, uh, for example, ex uh, excommunications, uh, but also uh, maybe more trivial but relevant facts, for example, uh, uh, the Pope asking the Doge of Venice uh, uh, for people who are good at mosaic because he wants to build a church that is now in Rome for example, and you can see. And so this, there you have proof that the uh, people who made the mosaics in that specific uh, basilica were actually from Venetia. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I go very quick. So, um, so uh, we decided to build a transcription system that also worked in these most challenging cases. Uh, what's the problem with that? Uh, if you decide to build, for example, a classifier, so a tool that say you give it a word and it says which word is it, then you have to provide thousands of examples for each word you decide to, rec to recognize. But the distribution of words is actually very, very skewed. Uh, so uh, as you can see, um, this is a logarithmic scale, which, is a, which actually means that this is an inverse exponential. And there is very few words who, who, who um, occur many, many times. For example, uh, 
what we usually call stop words, so by the uh, articles, uh, pronouns, uh, and something like that, uh, and th that are also the least relevant to the content of the document, actually. And there is many, many, many words. Most of the words in 100 pages uh, occur less than 30 times. So it gets very challenging to build a system like that. Uh, because uh, you need to transcribe thousands of images. And there is actually systems who do that, but uh, 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 paleographers, for example, or people who transcribe by, by, by job, uh, get discouraging using them because they don't want to transcribe that much. It would be too much cost-consuming. So our solution, our cheat code to this, uh, is to apply a crowdsourcing uh, uh, solution so that uh, we split the task into a more simple one, uh, where we only ask to do pattern recognition. It's a bit like, have you ever asked by Google, uh, click the boxes where there's a car? That's pretty much the same thing. We provide people, uh, in this case, uh, our workers were high school students uh, we involved in the project. And we ask them to mark uh, the elements uh, that looked like some characters. This is good but because it also allows us to um, <clears throat> Uh, to cover some particular characters uh, that actually represent entire words uh, that we call abbreviations. So uh, this is an overview of the system. Since I'm running short on time, uh, I won't go uh, too much deep into it, but I will, I will make a bit of advertisement and I will be at the workshops tomorrow and, uh, and I will talk extensively about that and we will build some parts of it in the workshop. So if you're curious about the technology behind it, come meet me. And these are the results on 14 pages. Uh, we tried, uh, we had uh, transcribed by an expert, uh, and then we confronted the uh, system, uh, uh, the system performance. And it's about we're about 80% uh, correct uh, in the top three transcription we produce. Because for every word, uh, we no, do not produce only one transcription, but uh, three or more actually tentative transcription. And amongst these top three, in the 80% 80, 80 of the cases, uh, there is the correct word, uh, which is the one in the blue bars. Orange bars are those with one error, and the green bars are those with two errors. What's next? So uh, we are working to build a search engine on the pages that we are actually transcribing. Uh, and we're also working to uh, use this system to assist the transcription of an expert so that we can get more data and move to an end-to-end -end neural system. And of course, uh, extend our project not just to these particular uh, documents, uh, but to, uh, for example, legal documents uh, or different handwritings, different languages. Thank you. There's only my email because I don't have Twitter, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Elena. Uh, and now you, we will hear from um, Thomas Van Dijk. And uh, again, I'm going to um, point you to our uh, online version of the, the website, in, which I believe has been updated. Um, so there was something, uh, there was a mistake um, in Thomas's bio that's now been uh, fixed. Um, so it should be accurate now. Thomas is coming to us um, from University of Würzburg uh, as a, a postdoctoral researcher, right? Not, exactly. Not head of the entire department, as it said before. <laughs> so if anybody needs a head of department, um, <laughs> maybe come talk to me afterwards. Thank you for that um, introduction. Um, I'm Thomas, and I'd like to talk to you about some stuff that I've been working on. Um, it's called map feature extraction on the slides here, like my more general deal as a researcher is on algorithmically guided user interaction. Um, I was asked to talk about maps, um, and specifically I really like old maps. So here's an example from the Würzburg University Library. This is a map from 1743. Um, it has a title but that is basically the only way that you could find it in the archive. You would have to know what it's called or the year or who drew it. There was some metadata, but you couldn't really say, librarian, please give me the maps that you have that have Reich, what's it called, Reichenmannshausen on it in this century. But there's lots of information on these maps and some of them have legends that say what kind of stuff is on this map and what all of these pictograms mean. So this is nicely formatted, but then if you look at the map, some of it is a bit of a mess. Um, 
Um, we just heard that it's actually hard to read handwritten text. People are working on this a lot, but it's still a hard problem. This is going to be a disaster for a computer to figure out. Um, so this is another view of the same map. Here's a different map. It looks kind of similar, so if you would be able to train some kind of algorithm on the first one, maybe you would get some results on the second one. But a lot of these historical maps look very differently. So that means that it's going to be very hard to use deep learning type results to transfer your results to somewhere else. Um, here's a different map. It does not look similar to the first one. This one might actually be easy to extract information from because all of the place markers are red and the forest is green, but it's just this map that looks like that. So you could make an algorithm that does work on this map, but then how much work is it to make that algorithm versus just doing the thing on the map. I have one more example. This is the oldest map of the surroundings of Würzburg that we have at the library. It's from 15 something, 60s maybe. And here's a little zoom in on that. And I want you to think about how would a computer understand and digitize and extract information from this map. I'm going to zoom in in the top part. There are three place markers and there are three labels. Would you say that this is the correct assignment between the place markers and the labels? Please raise your hands. <laughs> okay, how about maybe this one? That kind of makes sense because it's more horizontal. But then the guy on the right is a little bit weird, so maybe it's like this? Um, um, I'm going to disappoint you, I do not know. I <laughs> I researched this and I found a book that talked about some of these places because they're not on the map anymore, but one of them, there's still a church named like that and there's a park with the other name and they have to know that this map is oriented south. And um, I forget what the result was, but here's the thing. Somebody who does this research and looks into the history can figure this out and tell you the result. Like a computer is not going to have all this historical context information, like how, what do you give your computer to make it do all that? So, well, now what? Um, if I want to extract, automatically extract information from this kinds of data where I've just tried to argue that a computer cannot do that without general intelligence. So now what? Okay, I will briefly make an aside about a pet peeve of mine. Computer science is not about computers. I'm a computer scientist, but this is an accident of the English language. Um, in Dutch, for example, it's called informatica, which has information in it, which is, to my mind, closer. And now computer scientists can have a big fight about what it is about. Um, there's a Dutch computer scientist who's quite famous who has said, calling computer science is like calling surgery knife science. <laughs> You use that, but that's not what you're studying. And for me, my personal answer is computer science is about efficiency. It's about making clever use of limited resources. And a lot of the time that's computation time or storage space or network connections. But you know, computer scientists are smart about optimizing things and how to make efficient use of things. And here's the thing. Human effort can be considered a resource, and you can be smart about how you use human, uh, human effort and human time. So here's one more quote by this Dutch guy, Dijkstra. The art of programming, or more generally computer science, is the art of organizing complexity, of mastering multitude, and avoiding its bastard chaos as effectively as possible. I repeat, so now what? Um, this, these maps that I showed you, they were quite chaotic. What do we do? I asked you the question, which labels and which place markers belong together? Well, for most of them on the map, it's actually quite clear. So here's a screenshot of a system that we made that tries, if you give it where the labels are and where the pictograms are, tries to figure out which one belongs to which. And the color coding you see here is how certain the algorithm is of the assignments. So a lot of them are green and they're pretty obvious. And the situation in the middle where I drew in the cursor, that's actually where the algorithm said it was least sure. And that's precisely the situation where you need a human to look at it. So what you can do now, what we try to do, is have the computer try to do all the things that are obvious to it, that may not necessarily be the things that are obvious to humans, but have the computer do the things that it can do but then do enough math and computer science and algorithms to have it realize where it needs help and then show 
the uncertain parts to a human and get the help that you need. Because the human only needs to say, no, don't worry about it. I did the research. It's like this. Now you figure out the rest. Okay, that's one thing. And I will spend the rest of my time showing you a little bit of a different system that you can also play with tomorrow at the MAPS workshop. Here are some screenshots. So what we're trying to do is if, it's, if it takes general intelligence to read and understand a map, then, well, now what? So let's actually figure out small tasks, small well-defined tasks where you can get the computer to do the stuff for you. So um, it actually um, goes quite well into the previous talk. What we said here is let's try to figure out, let's try to find pictograms on historical maps. Um, we just, in the previous talk, saw a bunch of characters A. In this example, I will also be looking for the character A on this map. So what we made is a system, and it actually works in black and white. And what you do is you look around the map, and then you say, okay, you give a small rectangular example, so this A, for example. And now you say, I want to know, I want to find all of the occurrences of the character A. And then you get this, because this algorithm is pretty dumb. It just compares pixels. We took some simple off-the-shelf algorithm, and it found a bit of the river that sloped in the same direction. Maybe that's an A. It doesn't know. Um, so the computer can find good, plausible candidates, but it cannot tell the content, the actual meaning of it. So that's what we're taking the, the human. So just as some example, this, this actually makes sense. Here we see an A, and then there's this blotch that kind of has a similar shape. That's definitely not an A. The D has an A shape in it, and then there's an actual A. So we sat down, and I say we. My PhD student sat down and looked at all of these thousand matches and said if they're correct or not. And what we got here was where the algorithm says, oh, this looks most like an A. That was actually true. Then there's this transition area, and then all of the things that were worse scores, this diagram is sorted by score. The rest is garbage, but like you don't know how many A's there are on the map, so where do you find this difference? And so what we did was we made this interface. This, um, you have by now also seen Google have this three by three interface. It's, I guess, a design that makes sense because lots of people come up with this. And we ask these nine things, okay, hey user, is this an A or not? So the user clicks, okay, that's an A, the rest wasn't. Now the question is, where do you ask the user for help? Which nine things do you show the user? And what we do is in this diagram, on the left are the best matches, on the right are the worst matches, on the top is the concept, this is an A. On the bottom is the concept, this is not an A. We assume the best nine matches are A's, the worst nine matches are not A's, and we fit a regression model. And then we use a thing called uncertainty sampling, which is you ask the user wherever the model is most uncertain. So right now that's in the middle. The user said, no, these are, none of these are A's. So then again, you fit the model, you ask where is it most uncertain, you ask there. Some A's, some non-A's. You keep going. And so what happened now is we asked very few questions where things were definitely A's. We asked very few questions where all of it was trash. We ended up asking a lot of questions precisely in the area where the algorithm couldn't tell whether it was an A or not. So that was the system. You can come play with it tomorrow. Uh, we have a thing. It runs on phones, actually. Um, and I want to leave you with some homework. Uh, the first step is for computer scientists, so for not a lot of people here, think about human interaction when you're trying to design an algorithm. Second step, I guess, is for you all. Think about algorithms when you're designing interfaces. What parts could you have a computer do for you? And if the computer can't do it all for you, is there a small thing that you could have a human do so that the rest can be automatic? Thank you. So much. To Thank you, Thomas. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Katie McDonough. Um, Katie is returning to Stanford, where she was uh, prior to her current gig, which is working this exciting new um, project, Living with Machines, 
at the collaboration between the Turing Institute and the British Library. So we'll be hearing about some of the uh, specific projects you've been working on, but also kind of a bit generally about that, that effort overall. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thanks to all the organizers. It's really exciting to be here. Um, like Nicole said, I'm gonna be talking about living with machines. You can see all of our partners here. Um, this is who we are. Uh, we're about, I don't even know if this is up to date now, but we're about 23 people. Uh, we're funded by the AHRC, which is the British version of the NEH for, those, for the Americans, uh, as part of a sort of big new strategic priorities fund. We are one of the largest humanities science collaborations in UK history, uh, and we're based at the Alan Turing Institute, which is a fairly new uh, institution. It's about three and a half years old now. Uh, and it, it was created to be a kind of national data science institute for the UK. Uh, we are the first project um, that, despite the fact that the Turing Institute is physically located inside the BL, uh, we are the first project to be a collaboration with the BL at the Turing. The point of living with machines is to study the lived experience of industrialization during the long 19th century in Great Britain, uh, sadly, no Ireland. Um, how are we doing this? We are using machines to understand machines uh, as they arrive in society, complex machines. Uh, and this is a, what we call a radical interdisciplinary collaboration. As you can see up here, there are historians, there are uh, our PI, Ruth Honor is actually a, a literary historian. There are data scientists who come from many different backgrounds, uh, geophysics, for example. Uh, we have computational linguists, uh, people with a kind of hybrid uh, a, a background in DH, um, and we have permanent staff at the BL who are hired specifically for this project who also have a variety of, of backgrounds. Um, so we're very, very lucky to have an amazing team. Uh, the work that we do is based on a, a sort of collaborative research philosophy that is um, very self-reflexive and iterative, and I hope that some of what I talk about today will be a reflection of that. Uh, we're very interested in um, developing best practices for collaboration and exchange across institutions, across fields, um, from early to mid to late to career, right? Lots of different kinds of best practices uh, and exchanges and joining the ethos and methods of data science and uh, humanities research. So uh, basically until the end of October, we were organized around a lab-based model. We have recently, uh, nixed the labs and are reorganizing ourselves. Uh, please ask me questions about that uh, during the coffee break. It's uh, very emotional and exciting. But uh, I'm gonna talk to you today about what was formerly known as the Space and Time Lab, uh, which I played a key role in. But it's important to say that essentially I played a role and um, I would say that this applies to all, almost everyone on the team. Everyone was in all of the labs, all right? So we were not discrete, uh, uh, groups uh, isolated from each other, but each lab had a slightly different uh, goal, which we called a minimum research output, which we've just presented and is uh, a kind of foundation for us to decide what we want to accomplish over the next three to three and a half years. So uh, the core information I want to talk about today uh, actually picks up really nicely from uh, the previous talks, which is uh, how, do we, how do we work with maps at scale? Uh, so, um, place, uh, we're interested in maps because we're interested in spatial information. Place is really important in living with machines. It's everywhere along with time. It's a connective tissue between the people and events and institutions that we encounter in our sources. We have an opportunity in this project to think about the construction of places in the industrialized landscape and how these places are represented in our sources. So for this reason, it's really important to address the discrete appearance of place in texts, uh, the relatively new, uh, in the 19th century, style of continuous representation of place in maps, uh, and the hybrid of tabular data, which can either be derived from text or visual information. Uh, so in order to manage these different kinds of spatial data and their relationships, we want to move outside the box of typical approaches to digitizing historical spatial information. Um, so uh, for me, uh, 
Uh, I come from a background of doing spatial history work. One of the things that I'm pretty interested in is paying attention to this uh, visual content of maps in, in a slightly different way. So I'm just gonna read you a quick quote from um, a scholar who works in, um, in GeoAI, uh, Yao Yi Cheng. This is from an, a 2015 article called Querying Historical Maps as a Unified, Structured, and Linked Spatiotemporal Source. So he says, and this is to give you an idea of a kind of typical workflow of working with scanned historical maps. Once a user identifies the maps of interest, the next challenge is to efficiently convert the map content to machine-readable format. The mainstream approach for this purpose still relies uh, heavily on manual work with some help from raster to vector conversion data. So there's, there's really this kind of built-in assumption that when you have a historical map, the thing that you're going to do with that map is create vector data. Um, and what I wanted to do in Living with Machines is really step back from that assumption uh, that we are turning maps, uh, specific pieces of information on maps into vector data, this extraction. Um, and instead, how can we really make better use of the continuous representation of space and maps? Um, and, you know, this goes into a kind of rethinking of how historians are using maps, but across all fields, uh, including libraries. And this is really important in terms of thinking about the spatial context of industrialization. So instead of in spatial history turning data into maps, uh, we want to think about how to turn maps into data. Now, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I feel it's gonna get very repetitive in here, but the, the problem is how do you do this at scale? As, as Thomas just mentioned, uh, people who study maps uh, are used to evaluating uh, visual rhetoric on a sheet by sheet basis. Uh, a historian walks into a map library and sits there for a few months, I wrote months, that's really generous, wow. <laughs> a few days, uh, observing, thinking, studying uh, the, a map or maybe 10 maps carefully um, and discussing questions with curators. I do this at the map room at the BL, I've done it here. Uh, how do we scale up this kind of critical assessment of historical maps? How do we put our understanding of the bias and the production and the collection of maps to use for research about industrialization? Um, and so, in sort of translating that into informa information science terms, what does metadata enrichment, exploration, and indexing of digitized map collections allow us to do? How do we do that? Uh, so, in treating maps as data, uh, we, getting my order mixed up here, uh, in treating maps as data, uh, we want to not extract and abstract information that we then treat as fact, uh, but we want to retain a sense of the production and collection context of a map. We resist singling out a small number of features on a set of maps uh, and turning those into vector data uh, and interpreting those as, as a kind of truth statement. Uh, and so our goal is to have the maps remain present in our analysis because any output we generate would always be tied to metadata about location, about the digital object and the original document. So the map isn't an objective document, but a product of its makers and the information visualization practices of the 19th century. All right, so what are we working with? Here we have a, a collection of ordnance survey maps that uh, we've uh, been given access to from the National Library of Scotland, um, uh, prim primarily working with Chris Fleet, who has just been a core uh, a contributor to this project. And you can see that there's a kind of collection of um, materials at different scales um, that were printed, surveyed and printed at different times that have been scanned and some of which have been geo-referenced. So this table, it, you know, it might, it's like, oh, that's, that's laid out really great. We know what we have. We actually don't know what we have and I'm gonna come back to that at the end, but we have a lot. We know that we have a lot. Um, and what are we gonna do with all of these maps? So how, what's an application of this idea of moving away from ab, uh, abstracting and extracting uh, to thinking about uh, the visual uh, context? Uh, a really nice example of this for the 19th century is moving away from thinking about uh, what we can get out of maps as uh, 
railroad vector data, uh, and thinking about uh, the spatial context of railroads in terms of sightings and depots and, and all of the other kinds of uh, spaces related to railroads in the landscape. When you extract rail data, this is what you get. Um, you end up uh, ignoring all the other content in, in, in A, in the map sheet. So what we're doing is we're uh, taking uh, uh, um, basically uh, computer vision methods uh, and focusing really just on, on part A, image classification. We're breaking down uh, these map sheets into very, very tiny segments and classifying them. Uh, so here's just to walk you through an example. Vector data gives us points about uh, uh, rail, uh, rail stations. Uh, we then develop a series of classes for CV. We have a class for where there are buildings related to railroads, where there are multiple tracks or intersections, where there, are, or, uh, where there is one track going through the landscape and where there's nothing. Um, we then can sort of test and overlay this with the vector uh, data to uh, evaluate how well our classification works. Uh, and then we can look at this over time. Um, so we're essentially uh, building uh, a way to classify these texts. There's lots of other kinds of questions we can ask. For example, here, this was one of our earliest experiments where we said, is there a building or is there no building? Um, and what's quite nice about this is that after about uh, 20 minutes of, of annotations, around 100 annotations that we did, we got a 92% accuracy rate. And let me see if this will just work really closely. So this is us working in Jupyter Notebooks that we developed in a series of hack days uh, within the team. Uh, so making annotations to arrive at that eventual 92% score. Um, so... Just to wrap up, uh, I will get rid of that. Make it stop so you don't get nauseous. How do I do it? Where's my mouse? Ah, okay, I'll go there, that's fine. Um, so, you know, we're slicing the map into tiny segments. We're storing these classifications and adding that as metadata about a sheet. And for example, we can say that there are a certain percent of that sheet's map segments uh, have a certain classification. We can add that as metadata. And then we can view and sort and sample that metadata for different kinds of, of interpretive tasks. And one of the really lovely things that um, our colleague Olivia Vane has, has created is a visualization um, of map metadata. And this particular image uh, uh, shows survey and revision uh, dates for the OS uh, 6 and 25 inch collection, collections. Uh, but you could view any metadata here. And then it takes you back to the sheets. It allows you to select a subsample to, to continue with your research. Uh, so uh, finally, just to, just to sum up, uh, this is a very iterative process. We're developing classification tasks of many kinds, including the rail space project. We're enriching metadata, which we will give back to the libraries. Uh, we want to improve our own discovery, but also public discovery of, of what's in maps uh, and allow uh, people to have access to that labeled information in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, now we're going to hear from Thomas Smits, who is uh, joining us from uh, the National Library of Netherlands. And um, Thomas, who came to our attention uh, through the, um, oh, let me, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, through his uh, co-authored uh, piece um, with Melvin Weber's uh, The Visual Digital Turn, Using Neural Networks to Study Historical Images. Right, uh, also, uh, yeah, so I'm Thomas. Uh, thank you to the organizers also for hosting this wonderful event. I'm really looking forward uh, to the, also to the next day, uh, tomorrow at the workshops. So uh, today I will present uh, two tools and databases uh, that both use, uh, use computer vision techniques to explore and analyze large visual data sets which we extracted uh, from digitized newspaper collections. So uh, after acknowledging the team behind this uh, whole operation, and a very short introduction, I will first uh, talk about a chronic uh, acronym, so uh, classified historical newspaper images, and then Siamese or similarly uh, advertisement search. 
and then end with a very short uh, discussion on uh, the visual digital turn. Uh, so this is the team. Uh, the tools were, were developed during a uh, research residency at the National Library of the Netherlands, which pairs humanities researchers with programmers. And in our case, uh, that was uh, me and my co uh, colleague Melvin Wevers with uh, Willem Jan Faber and Juliette Tonay. And I also wanted to uh, mention uh, the research director, Martijn Klepp, who was really important uh, for getting this whole team uh, together. Um, so the starting point of our research was basically uh, that the National Library of the Netherlands holds a very large collection of digitized newspaper, uh, digitized newspapers. so around 100 million pages uh, that are not only newspapers but also books and uh, periodicals. Um, and all these uh, pages can be accessed via its uh, interface, web interface, Delver. So most of the research done in this collection has been focused on text, right? As uh, many of you will know, most digital humanities research has been very much text-focused, which is mainly a result of the availability of OCR technology. Um, of course, digitized newspapers not only contain text, but also millions upon millions of images, photographs of the news, uh, advertisements, political cartoons, uh, you name it. So when we started our research, uh, there was just this, uh, uh, there were some uh, new techniques becoming available, like off-the-shelf convolutional neural networks, so new computer vision techniques, which we thought might be able to sort of uh, help us analyze these uh, pictures. So the question was then, how can we use convolutional neural networks to explore and analyze uh, large visual data sets? We started by extracting two uh, data sets from Delver. So first, the chronic data sets, which contains around 450,000 images uh, extracted from the whole data set, so all the digitized newspapers, uh, between 1860 and 1930. And Siamese set, which contains 420,000 historical advertisements uh, published in three important Dutch newspapers between 1945 and 1995. Um, we had to sort of uh, approach these uh, two data sets in three different ways, uh, all using conv uh, convolutional neural networks. So we tried to detect medium-specific features, so we separated photographs from illustrations. We queried based on visual similarity, so we clustered visually similar advertisements. And we added uh, visual categories based on the input from domain experts. So in this case, that was uh, us, we were the domain experts. Uh, so to start with the first approach. Um, in my dissertation, uh, which I hope will be published later this month as a book, so I'm very excited about that, uh, I focus on uh, 19th century illustrations of the news. And during the writing of this thesis, I became very sort of interested in the transition uh, from the use of illustrations to photographs to visualize the news. Was this sort of a gradual transition or was it more of a clear-cut uh, watershed moment? And more in general, maybe uh, when did Dutch newspapers start publishing images uh, anyway, right? So traditionally, being a very much a traditional media historian, I would study this by close reading a very select number of sources. Uh, however, just as OCR technology allows us to distant read uh, text, we can now use convolutional neural networks to distant read or distant view, as my colleagues uh, Lauren Tilton and Taylor Arnold have called it, uh, visual culture. Um, so for my project, with the help of my colleague Leo Impet, we trained the convolutional neural network to make a distinction between illustrations and photographs of the news. And with the help of this algorithm, we can classify all chronics 450,000 images. Uh, and the figure on the slide, which you can see here, is a visualization uh, of all the illustrations and photographs in the digitized newspapers of the Dutch National Library uh, between 1860 and 1930. So as you can see, uh, the number of illustrations, so both, uh, both illustrations and photographs, increased noticeably in the early 1900s, uh, but really started to peak at the, in the early 1920s. This is when the moment when the Dutch visual news culture really sort of uh, jumped off. And this also completed, for me as a media story, a very important development, namely a development from 19th century publications uh, filled with letters to publications filled with images and text, so the form of the newspaper we still uh, know today. So for our second approach, we used a pre-trained convolutional neural network to cluster visually similar advertisements. And following the work uh, of our uh, colleague Benoit Sinquin, uh, we turned to the penultimate layer of a convolutional uh, neural network. Uh, and in this penultimate layer, after numerous convolutions and transformations, and if you want to know more about how these convolutional neural networks work, uh, please come to my workshop tomorrow while I try to explain them from a historian's point of view, which is going to be interesting, I guess. Um, um, but so in this penultimate layer, an image is represented as a 2048 dimensional vector, uh, or in layman's terms, uh, which I'm also, I guess, a list of 2048 numbers. Um, using these numbers, uh, we can cluster visually similar images. 
So in the multidimensional vector space, we can look for points that are relatively close to each other, also called nearest neighbors. And uh, simply put, uh, similar sets of numbers in two uh, images suggest particular visual similarities. So on the basis of the vector values, we created Siamese, a web interface for querying advertisements based on their abstract visual similarity. So uh, the tool presents users with the 10 most similar images to a source image and a timeline consisting of the 10 most um, similar images in every year between 1948 and 1995. So the first option allows users to uh, sort of detect whether the source image was part of an identifiable visual style, while the latter shows the development of this such style or trend uh, over time. So then on to our uh, final approach. Uh, using modern neural networks, it can be quite difficult to recognize objects on historical images. This mainly has to do with the trading material of these uh, modern neural networks, which are mostly consist of high-definition photographs extracted from the internet, mainly in ImageNet, as we heard this morning. However, we can also create our own classifiers for all sorts of historical visual material by training a new classific uh, classification layer on top of an already existing model, an often used method uh, called the TensorFlow for Poets method sometimes. And uh, we decided to try nine different uh, or relevant categories, so images of buildings, uh, cartoons, chess problems, uh, images of crowds, logos, uh, maps, as you can see here on the slide, uh, schematics, sheet music, and also weather reports. So a major advantage of this approach is that instead of training a whole new convolutional neural network, we only need a very small number of uh, training images, so around 25 positive and 25 negative images. So similar to OCR technology, this technique gives us direct access to the visual content of images without having to refer to the textual descriptions uh, or the metadata. So to search through the images of Chronic on the basis of their visual content, um, yep, uh, we created a web application called Chrome Reader, which allows users to search through uh, newspaper images based on visual content and keywords in the articles that accompany the images. So in this case, photographs or illustrations, together with the category faces and the keyword president in the accompanying article, will give you uh, illustrations and photographs of uh, US presidents in this case. Uh, I hope it comes up. Yeah, so there you go, right? Um, so, that were our three approaches. We are now working on, uh, very short, to using studying GANs to uh, GANs, our type of convolutional neural network, to study gender displays in one million historical advertisements. We are looking for the perfect 1950 um, uh, sort of advertisement phase. Just a very short, if you want to know more about this, please uh, read our abstract. Uh, and then, finally, so, um, based on this work for the National Library, we argue in a recent article in Digital Scholarship in the, uh, Digital Scholarship in the Humanities that the rapid development of convolutional neural networks has opened up the so-called visual digital turn. So the possibility to explore and analyze large visual data sets at scale using computational means. Um, and to close off, while I think that convolutional neural networks are indispensable if you want to understand our sort of uh, visual uh, modernity, uh, their application in humanities research also leads to some very fundamental uh, theoretical, methodological, but also ethical issues. If you want to know more about these, I uh, would welcome you to uh, come to my workshop again uh, tomorrow. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, and I will be happy to answer any questions, but I guess we have no time for that, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you so much, Thomas. And next, we're going to hear from Kyle McDonald. Um, now, Kyle is uh, an artist who works with code. <laughs> and Kyle is going to be uh, in the, the panel that will follow um, after, this, uh, after our coffee break. And that's uh, the panel um, led by Vanessa Cam. I actually know Kyle um, uh, not through his own work, actually, but in fact, um, because it was Kyle who um, assisted and advised a student, Zaria Howard, who was working on um, a project that was collaboration between um, the, uh, the Carnegie Museum's uh, uh, Teeny Harris archive that Dominique Luster is uh, leading, the archivist for. Um, so Zaria Howard was a student and she was doing some interesting work on, on images. Uh, you remember her. <laughs> yeah, definitely, I'll mention her. I'm so glad to have um, Kyle here and, uh, and he, as I said, he'll be in the follow-up panel as well. Awesome, uh, thanks for having me. Like you just heard, my name's Kyle, I'm an artist. I'm visiting from Los Angeles and I started with uh, machine learning um, to solve a very practical problem. I had trouble keeping track of the 
audio samples I use for making music and doing sound design. So I tried organizing them in a big cloud using some of the same similarity techniques. Um, this is what it sounds like. Welcome. Oh. Welcome. Hello. 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 All the bass gets in one area next to the kicks. All the hi-hats are up there. It's the same idea, all the similar things are together, the different things are apart as um, some of the previous presenters work. Um, this led to some consulting work I did with Google Creative Lab where I advised and wrote code for a few uh, projects that live online. Um, we turned that kind of sound organization system I just showed you into a drum sequencer called Infinite Drum Machine. We worked with uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology to organize North American bird sounds. Um, we built a small hardware synth that uses some machine learning to blend or interpolate between different samples. And recently we worked with uh, NOAA to find patterns in many terabytes of humpback whale recordings. Um, those same techniques that I use for the sounds can also be applied to other media, uh, like images. So in this case, I was working with um, a studio in Japan called Rhizomatics on an archive from researcher Itsuo Sakane, who has spent decades documenting media art um, around the world. And he's got this unparalleled collection of hundreds of hours of video that have just recently been digitized. So we extracted these really high-level features from the videos um, using convolutional neural network. So these abstract concepts like um, green background or blue sky or circular objects or eye shapes or feathery textures, they all get grouped together. In this area, we saw some faces and we could see what frames were coming from the same video and watch them. Um, Laying out all the images in a collection or the sounds isn't always the most helpful thing. Um, sometimes when uh, machine learning provides a metric of similarity, another approach is to build a search tool. Uh, so again, working with um, another studio, the Studio for Creative Inquiry at Carnegie Mellon, uh, we built this similar image search tool for satellite imagery, which is designed to help the public find patterns of interest uh, in maps, or sorry, in satellite imagery. and to democratize geospatial intelligence. It's really ideal for locating infrastructure that's not usually indicated on maps. So for example, if you click on one container yard, it pulls up other container yards, and it works just as well with cul-de-sacs or sand traps or power lines or tennis courts. Um, we, as humans, we like to make marks on maps. We like to create metadata when we think something matters. But it's interesting to me that to a neural network, everything's remarkable. I've also been working with the Studio for Creative Inquiry to analyze the work of Tini Harris, like you just heard, um, uh, who's a newspaper photographer from Pittsburgh who documented the African-American community there from the 30s through the 70s. Uh, the Carnegie Museum of Art calls his 70,000 photos one of the most detailed and intimate records of the black urban experience known today. I've worked with uh, the museum and some other folks to help analyze and sort these photos in ways that are kind of intuitive and playful for newcomers to the collection to explore, but also helpful for the curators and the archivists who are working with Harris's images. And he didn't keep notes on his images. There's just kind of a bunch of boxes that have the photos shuffled into them. So there's a lot of questions about those photos. One of the main efforts we're working on is um, to help the archivists identify who are in these photos. Many of these people are still around. Um, Cross-referencing hundreds of thousands of faces is probably best accomplished with automatic face recognition, which is kind of neat for me because in most of my work, I treat tools like face recognition as this potentially dangerous technology that needs to be carefully examined. Um, and it's really refreshing to work on a project where it's just like very clearly helping reconstruct the past and doing good. Um, Right now we're exploring different interface ideas for presenting these collections in intuitive ways uh, for an installation at the Carnegie Muse Museum of Art. Um, this whole process for me of training neural networks has, uh, and using neural networks has reframed how I see a lot of other kinds of lists or collections or sets of observations. Um, I, 
I, it makes me, it kind of gave me a new perspective on this book from this uh, experimental French writer, Georges Perec, called An Attempt at Exhausting a Place in Paris, where he sat on this bench in Paris for three days in 1974 and tried to write down everything that was happening around him, down to the smallest details. You know, a bus passes, a baguette peeks out of a bag, someone trips every little detail. And his writing really feels like this very human act of observation, something that can't be automated, but somehow he's still trapped in this automated system, this performance of his own design. So I decided to restage this performance with a crowd of people distributed across the internet. I thought maybe by crowdsourcing these observations, we could get closer to an understanding of what the computational gaze might feel like in the future. Um, so this idea became Exhausting a Crowd, uh, which I worked on with Jonas Yangyan, and we recorded 12 hours of a busy intersection in London, Piccadilly Circus, and streamed it online with a tool that allows people to add notes to the scene. And this is one of my favorite sequences. So it was added really, really early in the project by a handful of different people. I'm just gonna read it. So watch the couple kind of at the bottom right corner here. They're sort of walking up. and. It's annotated, and so then I says to Mabel, Mabel, wait, look over there. Kiss me, you fool. Gotta pee. <laughs> what, right here, right now? Yes, kiss me right on the lips. Couple kissing. It's amazing, because this story is told by multiple people <laughs> over many visits to the website. It's not one person. Do you think anyone's recording us? <laughs> And while I was working on this, I realized the kind of lie of mass surveillance, which is that more data leads to more knowledge. <laughs> but when you have a pile of data, it still takes humans to kind of sit with it <laughs> and make a story out of it. <laughs> I would guess you all know that already, but a lot of people who are building surveillance systems don't. Um, one of the biggest dangers of automated systems is that we can lose ourselves inside of them. We become the tools of the thing that we created. Maybe you've felt this as you've seen elections manipulated by botnets and psychographic profiling. Um, I looked into this piece, uh, or sorry, I kind of was looking into this feeling through this piece called Blind Self-Portrait with Matt Metz. And in this installation, the visitor sits down, holds pen to paper, and when they close their eyes, in that moment, the machine starts drawing using the visitor's own hand. And the human in the loop here is basically minimized. They're reduced to this fleshy apparatus that becomes tool of this larger system. Um, and when I talk to people who are afraid of artificial superintelligence, I think a lot about what it feels like to have your eyes closed while this machines moving your hand around, you sort of wonder if it's going to treat you as poorly as you've treated some other people when you had control over them. Or in this piece, People Keeper, uh, with Lauren McCarthy, we explore the possibility of machine intelligence controlling every aspect of our social life. We only have so much emotional bandwidth Bring it in. and limited time. Best of our social circles are widening. We don't know that's bad, but All those relationships. <laughs> Anything in general that makes you excited? Just can be overwhelming. Now there's an app. PeopleKeeper tracks your physical and emotional response while you're hanging out, and it analyzes the data to identify who stresses you out, and makes you excited, sad, or happy. See how your relationships stack up, and let PeopleKeeper find the ones that work for you. It'll automatically manage your relationships so you don't have to. Scheduling time with people that make you feel good and blocking the ones that don't. Forget fake friends, failed romance, and FOMO. Optimize your social life with PeopleKeeper. If you've been watching other artists over the last few years, you'll know that these examples are just one facet of machine learning in the arts. Many visual artists have flocked to new tools, building on machine learning techniques like generative adversarial networks and style transfer to build these surreal, Im surreal images. Um, and other people are focused on imitating human creativity instead of augmenting it. Um, I'm also interested in that kind of imitation. Uh, I've been working with Rhizomatics and uh, dance group 11Play to explore machine imitation in the context of dance. Here we trained a neural network to imitate and follow a dancer's movements. 
Um, and we tried to focus on this moment where the network is kind of unfinished, still learning how to dance from the human. And I think that unfinished state provides some insight into how the uh, network sees human movement. And for me, I'm most excited by that. That's what all my work's been coming back to, the way that <laughs> machine learning provides this alien perspective on ourselves. Um, I think in a lot of ways it mirrors the role of the artist in society um, if we kind of use it the right way. I, I love the way that my ego just starts to melt whenever I have to ask, was that piano piece really written by a bot? Um, I like that kind of fear of, like uh, that mixture of fear and delight um, that comes from seeing an automatic system accomplish something that seems impossible to automate. So one of my goals in making this kind of work is to create a space for reflection on these technologies in our everyday life um, and how they're affecting our society. I want to create spaces for building intuitions for weird intelligence. Thank you.